Chapter 5, verse 72 of the Quran makes it very clear. If you believe Jesus is God, you are going to hell. Chapter 5, verse 72 of the Quran. is classified as the only unforgivable sin. Shirk. Believing someone other than Allah is God. And the example that's given there is Jesus. So if I'm wrong about this, I'm going to hell. Forever. That didn't quite bother me as much as the other two, though. The next one was... Muslims, if they leave their Islamic faith, even here in the United States, they are often killed for it. Now, around the world, definitely, all four schools of Sunni thought believe in the law of apostasy, Sunni being one of the major divisions of Islam. All three schools of Shia thought believe in the law of apostasy. Under certain circumstances, you can be killed for leaving your faith. But even here, that very year, 2004, a family in New Jersey was stabbed to death because they accepted Christ and left Islam. But the biggest issue for me was that if I, as the only son in my family, accepted Christ, my family would feel like I had stabbed them in the heart. I mean, my mom and my dad, who loved me so much, who cared for me, who raised me, who gave up everything for me, would feel like I was attacking them. You have to understand, Islam for Muslims is more than just a set of beliefs, it's their identity. And our parents were not just followers of Islam. They, they lived Islam. Islam was their life, as it was mine. And to leave it would be like betrayal. I didn't realize this. This wasn't something I was consciously thinking. I just looked at the evidence and I said, oh, I'm not convinced. But the thing that was keeping me from being convinced was the cost that I would have to pay subconsciously. And so I began to pray. And I prayed fervently. And I prayed to God. I said, God, I have come to a point where I realize that I cannot figure out who you are. You have to tell me who you are. And if you will tell me to be a Christian and to follow Jesus, I will follow you. And if you tell me to stay a Muslim, I will follow you. Just give me a vision. Give me a dream. Give me something so that I know you're telling me what's the truth. And he did. He gave me a vision and he gave me three dreams over the course of a few months. I can't go into the details today because you guys got in for free, right? If you paid, I'd give you details. Really quick on this point, I want to just let you guys know that I'm going to kind of unpack what he's saying here about the visions and the dreams in the back end because I can kind of just anticipate the skepticism as I'm hearing him say this. So I'm going to provide actually a little bit of data to talk about what's going on specifically within Islam in the Middle East uh, around this subject. So I'll let him continue and then we'll hit that on the back end. I can't give you details today, but I will tell you this, through the vision and through the dreams, I realized that I had been given an invitation into heaven, and the only way I could accept that, uh, the only way I could get into heaven is if I accepted that invitation, the gospel message, and that's the only way I would be saved, otherwise I would be lost. God made this abundantly clear to me through dreams and visions, as he does with many Muslims around the world, by the way. And it was at that point that I was able to get away from the argumentation, get away from the, 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 the debates and all that, and just really focus on the message. I couldn't hear the gospel message before this point. I, it, it just did not make sense to me. But at this point, when I realized how much was at stake and God was showing me things and I had evidence and I had spiritual guidance, now I heard the message. And the Christian message is this. We have separated ourselves from God our loving Father, through our sins. Now, as a Muslim, that didn't make any sense to me because as a Muslim, I believe that if you do bad deeds, you can just do good deeds and you'll kind of cover them up. It'll be, it'll be taken care of, you know? If you, if you run through one red light, stop at the next one twice, you know? You'll, you'll be okay. You know, just, it's all okay. You know, at the end, just do more good than bad and you'll be fine. But what I realized when I really listened to the Christian message and understood it, I realized that sin is not like that at all. In fact, what, what makes sin so devastating is that God is holy. What does holy mean? Holy means set apart. It means God is above, is beyond. He's set apart from everything. And who is God? God is life. God is love. God is goodness. God is joy. God is hope. God is peace. God is purpose. And if I sin, what I am doing is I am intentionally removing myself from all of that. 
I'm removing myself from life, from love, from joy, from hope, from peace, from purpose. I am taking myself away from the source of all goodness when I sin. I am destroying my soul because sin is devastating. It's not just I can do more good things than bad. No, I'm supposed to do good anyway. The sin destroys you. I heard that message and I grasped it. And then I realized, wait a minute. How can I, are you telling me that I have separated myself from God? How can I bring myself back? I can't. I cannot bring myself back. But God knows that. And God knew that from the creation of the world. And he loves us so much that he is willing to take my sins. These are the things that I did against him. These are the things that I did to him, telling him I wasn't going to follow him. These are the things where I put my desires above my creator's desires. He's willing to take those very things upon himself because he loves us that much. This doesn't make any sense to the Muslim mind. It took me a long, long time to grasp it. It made no sense. Because I couldn't envision God leaving his throne. God is up there in heaven somewhere being worshipped by angels, surrounded by light and love and, and, and bliss, and that's where God is. Why in the world would he come here? He never would come here. He's too majestic for that. But the Christian message tells us that God did not consider his majesty something to grasp, something to hold on to. This is Philippians 2. He did not consider his place, his status, greater than his love for us. Are you telling me that the one who created the expanse of the universe, you guys live in Colorado, you can look up in the sky, you can see the stars bright as day at nighttime, and they're gorgeous, and there are billions of stars out there. You're telling me that the God who made and placed every single one of those in the sky, who knows exactly how long they're going to be there, exactly how long they have been there, exactly how bright their light is, exactly how hot they burn. The God who knows all of those, every single star ever made from the beginning of the universe till the end, he knows all of them, he placed them there as easily as by thinking about it. That God knew me and created me exactly the way he made me for a reason. And he knew that I would rebel against him, and yet he entered into this world, into this dirty, filthy, sinful world. Why? That kind of love makes no sense. And and then when he came, did he come as a king? Did he come as a prince? Did he come with all kinds of riches? No, he came and was born to two kids in a manger and grew up as a carpenter, working with his hands, serving other people, living and becoming friends with Fishermen, people who couldn't even make it through school, and those people who he poured himself into turned around and betrayed him, one of them with a kiss, so that he would have to go to his death. And what kind of death? You're telling me that our God was willing to suffer death on a cross? What is death on a cross? Is that bad? They had invented the most humiliating, painful way to kill someone at exactly the moment in history where God says, yes, that death is still worth it. When they whip you before putting you on the cross, they had determined exactly how to do it so that medically you would be in your most vulnerable state. They took a tail, a cat of nine tails is what it was called, a Roman whip, and they put little leather, dumb, uh, leather balls at the end of them, and they'd put metal dumbbells and shards of bone on these leather balls so that when they hit your skin, the, the metal dumbbells would cause your blood vessels to vasodilate, bringing more blood to the surface of your skin so that when the bones would latch into your skin and rip your skin off, you would bleed profusely and you'd lose all energy. And they do that across your entire body. So that by the time you get to the cross, you have no energy left when they drive nails through your nerves and destroy your hands and your feet. And every time you have to breathe one of your last rattling breaths on the cross, you have to scrape a back that is devoid of skin up and down splintered wood for each breath. God did that? 
He loves us that much? It's incomprehensible. But we know it's true. We know it's true. The resurrection happened. Jesus claimed to be God, then he died on the cross, and he proved it by rising from the dead. God died on the cross. That God who made the universe suffered that death because he loves us that much. That is the Christian message. That is worth believing. Now, if you ask me, Nabil, you had a perfect life. You had a family that loves you. You, had, you, had, you were becoming a doctor. You had, you had a good place in society. Everything was great for you. Was it worth it? Absolutely it was worth it. I would do it a hundred times over again. Today, my, mom, my mom and dad didn't come to my wedding. Every single time I see a video of a son dancing with his mother at his wedding, I have to think that it was worth it. Every time I see parents lovingly hug their children and say, we're proud of you, I have to think it was worth it. Because it was worth it. And if I have to die the same kind of death that Christ died in order to proclaim this message of hope to other people who are here, that would be the greatest honor I could ever have. What makes this even more profound is that Nabil did die young and he died um, gloriously without ever um, rejecting Christ, without rejecting this message. He died uh, physically painful, but joyfully ready to embrace the eternity before him. And I'm fully confident that he is with Jesus now in a far happier place and in a far more joyful place than any of us currently are. This video is heavy. This video contains, um, it contains a truth about God that I think is often overlooked, which is the connection between the majesty and the infiniteness of the Creator but then the the intimate nature that God has in the sense that he comes low and embraces death on a cross and offers himself for each and every person. It does boggle the mind. It does. I totally understand the Muslim sentiment that God couldn't do that, shouldn't do that, couldn't possibly be, be willing to do that. But there is such a power within the notion that the creator of all things and the perfect holy God is also willing to get his hands dirty, to enter into our mess, to solve our biggest problem, to contend against the problem of evil, and to provide to us through his death and his resurrection the mechanism by which humanity can have eternal life and eternal joy through connection with him. Not just righteousness for righteousness sake, but righteousness provided to us for the sake of knowing him, for becoming suitable creatures for the relationship with our creator that he apparently desires enough to be willing to do all of this for. So why, why would we, why do we resist the greatest grace? Why do we resist the greatest joy set before us when he embraced the greatest hell for the joy set before him? I'll, I will not, I will, I will forever um, struggle to understand the extent of the rebellion within the human heart against a God so loving and so glorious. But if you're, if you're listening to this video today, and some aspect of this great, glorious God and what he's done for you is, uh, is reaching you. If the truth of this is reaching your heart, I just want to say, take action on it. Don't just be a hearer of the word. Give your life to God. Embrace Christ. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Uh, it's, it's so clear in scripture. Like, open up the gospel according to John. Read it. Read the whole thing today. I dare you. Life is so short. Don't waste another day. Life is, life is, uh, is a vapor rising. It's the blink of an eye. It's so short. But the decisions that we make as it relates to this glorious cross and the Christ who is slain for us ring out throughout eternity. They have eternal implications. So, so choose this day whom you will serve and know that abundant life is found in Christ. 
I can say for myself, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was dead, but now I've been made alive. I once was blind, but now I see. The time is late. The king is coming. Choose this day whom you will serve. Thank you.